righteous precepts, true and tried. Well, let's turn to the righteous precepts of God as we continue our study in the book of Matthew, chapter 5. Matthew, chapter 5, we uh, went through, of course, all the Beatitudes, the be happies, the happy is text there, what it is to be a member of the kingdom and how that uh, it, it, it is worked out in our lives. And then uh, we kind of transition from that Christian character described in the first uh, 12 verses to the things that we ought to be doing in the world. And there was uh, the text then on the light and the salt there, how we are to be uh, of influence and power in this world through the gospel. And then we uh, uh, looked at uh, uh, just this overarching concept the last time. What about the law then? Has it sort of diminished and passed away? But we saw that Jesus said, I didn't come to abolish the law. I came to fulfill it, to bring it to its highest point, which meant that, that all things, all truth was ultimately to be found in our Lord Jesus Christ. He, and the fulfillment of all those old sacrifices are done away with because they were fulfilled. He was the Lamb of God. And the holiness of God was, was found in him and his righteousness. And so w when we walk with Jesus, we'll be walking in a fulfillment of the law. And then, of course, he, he switches over from that by describing how that's going to work out in our lives. And he picks up a number then of the commandments and he lays them out for us. And we're at the first one uh, today in uh, beginning at verse 21 there. And so let's uh, read verse 21 through 26. Hear God's word and uh, give it your attention. You have heard that it was said to those of old, you shall not murder. And whoever murders will be liable to the judgment. But I say to you that everyone who is angry with his brother will be liable to judgment. And whoever insults his brother will be liable to the council. And whoever says you fool will be liable to the hell, <coughs> to hell, the hell of fire. So if you're offering your gift at the altar and there remember that your brother has something against you, leave your gift there before the altar and go. First be reconciled to your brother and then come and offer your gift. Come to terms quickly with your accuser while you are going with him to court, lest your accuser hand you over to the judge and the judge to the guard and you be put in prison. And truly I say to you, you will never get out until you have paid the last penny. Let's uh, ask God's blessing upon this scripture. Lord, uh, open our eyes, ears, hearts, and minds to this, your word. Give us deep understanding and also a willingness to always be obeying the words that come from your mouth, from the scriptures to understand them rightly and to put them into practice in our lives. For this we ask you in Jesus' name, amen. Well, you know, there are ten commandments, and, and Jesus isn't going to take up all of the commandments. He's, he's going to take up some of the commandments, and he's going to uh, uh, take up some of the other issues that were there among the, the Jewish people at that time. Uh, but the first one he takes up is the idea of murder. And I've been sort of thinking about this. Why that one? You know, I mean, there are Ten Commandments. He could have taken up any one of those or even some subsets of those, like when he talks about oaths and other things. Why, why does he take up murder? And, and I came to the conclusion in my mind, it was because it's such an easy one for you to think you're keeping it. You know, I mean, I, I remember talking to a, a number of people over the years, uh, especially Roman Catholics, it seems like. But, uh, you know, when I asked them, well, uh, you know, how are you get to heaven? You know, and it's just like an instantaneous re response. Well, I've never killed anybody. And that was the sum and substance, you see. I've never murdered anyone. 
and that they thought everything was done and all is good with God. And Jesus is going to take this most obvious of commandments and drill down into it and show us, well, maybe it's not as good as you think it is. Maybe it's not so easy to blow God off and say, well, I'm good. Look, do not murder. I'm not a murderer. Well, we have a lot of murderers in our country, don't we? I mean, we're uh, a very murderous society with, uh, I think, about 50-some thousand every year in our country. And that doesn't count the legal murders like abortion, which probably exceed that as well. We have school shootings and domestic shootings and terrorism and suicide and all kinds of things in our country. So certainly this is a topic that speaks to human beings. Well, he begins this way in verse 21. You have heard it said of old, you shall not murder, and whoever murders will be liable to the judgment. Now, the Bible is very clear about this. You can go all the way back to Genesis chapter 9 and verse 6, and God institutes capital punishment as a penalty for murder. And the reason is given there in Genesis 9, 6, for in the image of God... He made man. And so when you take the life of another human being, you're not just uh, uh, taking away their physical body. You are committing an assault upon the living God himself, whose image resides even in fallen humanity. There. It's a serious thing. Now, you remember, this, is, this whole text is based on Exodus 20, where it says, you shall not kill. And... If you look at the Hebrew word there, though, we, it means don't murder someone. Because there are instances in which God has given the right for men to kill every man. Genesis 9, 6, the instance of, uh, of capital punishment. The instance of just wars where God calls nations to punish other nations and, and there's loss of life there. So what's being talked about here, though, in the commandment is, is the presumptuous killing of your neighbor. Uh, for instance, in Exodus chapter 12, 21 and verse 12, it says, But if a man comes presumptuously upon his neighbor to slay him with guile or deceit, you shall take him from my altar that he may die. And ma again, God reiterates that there is capital punishment or death for those who willfully, premeditatively, kill someone, their neighbor. In other words, society is to protect itself against murder as a crime. It was the first crime, well, I, I could say almost the first crime. The first crime, of course, is Adam and Eve choosing to go away from God, but the first recorded crime is Cain killing his brother Abel. And we find out when we delve down into this that Matthew chapter a 15, a few chapters later from where we're at, will say that murder is the manifestation of the evil human heart. For out of Matthew 5, 15, 19 says, For out of the heart proceed evil thoughts, murders, adulteries, fornications, and so forth. All those things murdered according to God then, and according to Matthew chapter 15, is not a matter of hereditariness, you just got bad genes. It's not a matter of you had a bad childhood and you had a bad upbringing and, or society is against you. It's a matter of the heart. Man has been given over in Romans chapter 1, verse 29, to a reprobate mind. And the, and the result of that mind that's filled with uh, rebellion against God is that we have unrighteousness and fornication and, and Paul lists the whole list, and right in the middle of that list is murder as well. God says in Proverbs chapter 6, verse 16 and 17, six things the Lord hates. One of them that he hates, murder. So it's a serious business, isn't it? Re in fact, Revelation, to, to sort of cap off the seriousness of murder, Revelation chapter 22 says, that the people who won't come in to the gates of eternal life are, and he makes a list of people, 
And right in the middle of that list are the murderers. The kingdom of God is no place for murderers. <laughs> now, so b it's important then to, to define what murder is. I mean, we have that sort of civil definition of someone premeditatively taking someone's life, but is that all there is to it? After all, Jesus is here in a conversation with the Jewish people who uh, thought they had this one checked off pretty easily. I mean, obviously, if you haven't killed anyone, taken a knife or a gun or a stone or a stick and killed anyone, you must be keeping this commandment. And that's how the Jews of the day were teaching this commandment. So as long as you haven't taken anybody's life, you've kept it. Now, uh, you might say, well, why didn't the people know better than that? Well, one of the reasons probably was that in the time that Jesus was uh, preaching and teaching, the people didn't even speak the language of the Bible anymore. They spoke Aramaic. And the Bible was written in what we would call classical Hebrew. And so even from the time of the captivity on, most people could not directly read the scriptures, so they were dependent upon what the rabbis said about the scriptures. And, uh, and what the rabbis were saying about this commandment, do not murder, was true, but it doesn't go far enough. And you know, beloved, partial truth is always the enemy of the real truth there. Don't kill or you'll be brought to the civil courts. That's what he says there at the beginning of verse 21. But the Old Testament was much more explicit about this than that. Listen to what it says in uh, Psalm 51.6. God desires truth in the inward parts. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, your soul, your mind, and your strength, and your neighbor as yourself. You see, the Pharisees did teach the Sixth Commandment, but they only taught it partially. They taught the external manifestation of that commandment. But Jesus says, I'm coming along to give you the right interpretation of this commandment. And what does he say? If we go back to the text there, it says, But I say to you that everyone who is angry with his brother will be liable to judgment. And whoever insults his brother will be liable to the council. And whoever says, you fool, will be liable to hell fire. He says, it's not simply an issue of murder alone. It's the issue of anger and hatred in your heart. You can't justify yourself before God simply because you haven't killed somebody. Because there could be hatred and anger in your heart, and you're the same as a murderer then. So this, this, the point of Jesus' first statement there as he begins this discussion is to tear away this false sense of pride, this false sense of, of uh, righteousness that the, that the Pharisees in his day had, that many people along with them had. They viewed themselves as okay before God. And Jesus is saying, well, only if you only understand the superficialness of the, can of the commandment. Because if you're angry with your brother, you are liable to the judgment. In other words, w let's translate that. What did he just say? He's talking about murder. He says, if you're angry with your brother, you are a murderer. That's pretty straightforward, isn't it? It's pretty devastating as well. It strips the Pharisees bare, and it, it does a, a pretty good job on stripping us bare as well before the Almighty God. You might hate more than a murderer hates. You might be angry more often than even a murderer is angry, but you haven't had the opportunity to exercise that. So frankly, who is the murderer? The answer is, all of us. 
Listen to John chapter 3, verse 15. Whoever hates his brother is a murderer. It's not a matter of taking the knife and sticking him. If your heart isn't right, you have become a murderer in your heart. Hate is an extension of anger. Anger leads to hatred, leads to murder. It's a common source of killing. So Jesus sort of strikes hard at us to show us that even the best of men, if the truth were known, is a murderer. They're the worst of men. And then he uses three illustrations to do that there in the text there he says but I say to you, everyone who is angry with his brother will be liable to judgment it's interesting there's sort of a little rabbinic play going on here the rabbis like to do things in threes and it looks like that's what he's doing here he says whoever everyone who's angry with his brother is liable to the judgment whoever insults his brother will be liable to the council that was a higher court and whoever says to you you fool will be liable to the hell of fire, Gehenna. And so what what he's doing is he's doing the very opposite. They were downplaying murder, making an external thing. He's increasing the guilt because he says, if you're mad, let's send you off to the civil court. And if you even say, uh, and the, 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 the the, the, the Hebrew word that's translated here is racha, for which we have no translation in, in modern English because we're, we're not certain exactly what it meant, uh, but it was some sort of an all insult, and you can let insults float through your mind. We have all kinds of insults in our language as well that might not ever even make it to the, to the dictionary. You blockhead, you idiot, uh, some of these insults that we have, that's what this word we think meant, and it was... Uh, you turn to your brother, you're mad at him, or you insult him, you're, you're, you're even liable for a greater punishment. That's the council, which would be like if we think of a county court or, or, or Sidro, then this would be the appellate court, the bigger court. We're going to send you off to that one. And if you say, you fool even, which I mean, how does that sound too bad, you know? but you're liable to to the fires of hell. That's how Jesus is sort of building his argument. Instead of decreasing the seriousness of the commandment, he increases it, you might say, a hundredfold. And when God said to us, do not kill, do not murder in the Old Testament, and when Jesus says that to us here in the New Testament, he's saying, I want you to understand it in all of its depths. If you're just angry with someone, you're in danger of judgment. Now he's not talking about righteous anger, and we don't have time to go into righteous anger this morning. He's talking about just plain old ang- old-fashioned, I'm mad at someone. Sinfully mad because they stepped on my toes, or they said something to me, or they did something to me, and my anger arose it can be a slow burn or it can be a a a, a blowing up kind of anger but when you go around carrying those kinds of grudges and anger inside of your heart jesus says you have become a murderer you're guilty before god second one was that we talked about this term raka there worthless fellow, empty-headed, blockhead, perhaps something like that it would be, and we could fill in all of our own translations today. And then thirdly, t- uh, the word m- m- from which we get moron in our own language, you fool. You're not even to, to, to say that to people. Unless it's true, of course. Jesus called the Pharisees fools. And he was right because they were rebelling against God. But we so often will call somebody a fool because of our own anger against them. And what's the severity of that crime? He said, well, you ought to be thrown in the garbage dump forever and ever. 
the word here uh, the for uh, Gehenna there. Uh, let me find it there for you. <coughs> Hell of fire was the word Gehenna because outside of Jerusalem, you remember that used to be the place where they worship Moloch and they burned their children to the in the to the god uh, gods there and they, it was a horrible place. Well, eventually they turned it into a garbage dump, and it was just full of trash and burning, smolding worms and garbage all the time. And so that became sort of the metaphor for hell itself there. God says, that's what you deserve. If you're carrying anger around in your heart, if you're insulting people, if you're calling them fools for no reason at all, you deserve to be smoldering and decaying in the garbage dump of hell, Gehenna, Forever there. So it's plain that, that Jesus attacks the sin of anger, the sin of slander, the sin of cursing, and he, along with that, he's destroying the self righteousness of people who think they're okay. So what's, what's at the heart of all this then? Well, anyone who is angry, anyone who murders somebody, of course, but anyone who is angry and insulting and cursing other people is destroying the image of God in somebody else and deserves the punishment of God upon their lives. But there's a second reason that this is wrong. And that's what he goes into next. He says, because also those things destroy your worship of God. You can't worship the living God if you're holding on to your anger and your insults and your grudges and your bitternesses. Now, is that true? Well, look what the text says. Verse 23. So if you are offering a gift at the altar... There remember that your brother has something against you. Leave your gift there before the altar and go and first be reconciled with your brother, brother and then come and offer your, your gift. You can't worship God right when you're a murderer in your heart, when you're angry in your heart. You can't just come... And, and, and the, the sort of the illustration is that the, the Pharisees, of course, were big ones for worship. You know, they were always going up to the temple. And, and uh, the illustration is, you know, we probably don't remember so much what happened, but oftentimes you'd bring a sacrifice. And when you brought your sacrifice, you were supposed to put your ha hands down on the head of the sacrifice and you were supposed to confess your sin there. And then the priest was to sacrifice the animal, and that was a picture of Jesus' sacrifice, and you were to be believing that, and, and you would be forgiven by God. Well, what's the situation? Well, here comes this Pharisee or any other person dragging their lamb up there. They're pretending to worship God, you see. They're hypocritically worshiping God, because at the same time that they're putting their hands and going through the motions of worship, their heart isn't right with God. They're still angry with their brother out there about something, and they know it. Now, we can't always know who's angry with us, you know, <laughs> but obviously Jesus is saying, you'll know it. You'll know when you come into my house to worship if your heart has not been reconciled, if you are not right. What a... <laughs> condemnation this is to us because how many times have we had a fight with our wife or something on the way to church and then we pull it together at the last minute and we go in and sit in the, in the pew and we act like we're here worshiping God like everybody else but in our heart we know we're not see or with our kids or or with somebody else it, it, it is not specific here it's just saying you can't worship God right unless you're keeping this commandment and being reconciled with the brother who is angry with you there 
because that was the principle all along. Listen to Isaiah. God's, God said to Israel through Isaiah in chapter 1, verse 11, For what purpose is the multitude of your sacrifices to me? What good are they all, says the Lord? I am full of your burnt offerings, the fat of rams and the fat of fed beasts. I de not, delight not in the blood of bullocks and lambs as he, and, and he goats. I don't want any more of your vain oblations. Your incense is an abomination to me, and your new moons and your feasts my soul hates. They are trouble unto me. I am weary of the, old, of the whole thing. Why? Because your hands are full of blood. You know, your murderers in your heart. Seek justice. Relieve the oppressed. Judge the fatherless. Plead, plead, for, the, plead for the widow. And it's interesting, too. Uh, notice the text very clearly says this. So if you're offering your gift at the altar and there, there remember that your brother has something against you. It may be not even that you are the one who's angry. But you know that someone else has been offended by you. And he says, go away right away. Don't come into my presence. That you go and deal with that there. You know, a lot of people say, uh, how can we make church be more what it ought to be? But maybe, we'll, maybe we need better music or, or, or we need uh, uh, a more worshipful time or we, 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 we need more special music or we need better sermons uh, or whatever it is that they, they say about that. Well, how about we throw this in? How about are you reconciled with your brother? When you come into worship, and tell everybody who comes to worship, if you got, if so, you know someone has something against you, get up and leave right now. Wonder what the service <laughs> would look like if we took that seriously. You see, God says, "If I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not hear me." So this is a serious thing, not only in terms of what real righteousness looks like, but it also is serious in terms of what worship looks like as well. God doesn't want us to come into his house in any hypocritical, ma hip hypocritical manner there and pretend that it's all right. And then he, he kind of closes that with, uh, with uh, by extending it even farther in, in the first part he says be reconciled to your brother your christian brothers i'm taking that to mean there in this text but even the outsiders you you shouldn't be letting things build up even with the strangers that's what i'm taking him to mean in verse 25 and 26 come to terms quickly with your accuser while you're going with him to court lest your accuser hand you over to the judge and the judge to the guard and you be cast into prison he's saying this is such an important concept that when you are keeping the sixth commandment, do not murder, it's not that you're just not angry and insulting people. It's not that you're, you can't worship because you're letting anger be built up with your own brothers. But even outside, if you're not doing right by the world around you, even in the practice of your business, then you're in you're in uh, you're in an infraction of this commandment. Now, I think I if we look at that uh, verse 25 and 26, obviously you're in the wrong too. That doesn't mean you won't have disputes with the the business world around you. There's lots of wicked people in the world, and there can be trouble. But it seems to be that uh, Jesus is assuming that you were in the wrong. Because he says you'll be cast into prison <laughs> if you don't make this right. That's, that's a reference to debtors' prisons, which they still had in those days. Uh, we don't have those in our society anymore. But the principle of being right in all of your relationships, your own heart, your own brothers, and even the world around, around you, He 
devastates their thoughts, doesn't he? Their comfort, their confidence, their smugness, their self-righteousness by setting a standard so high that nobody keeps it. Listen, who is a murderer? Ask yourself, who is a murderer? Have you ever been angry? Have you ever insulted anyone? Even under your breath? Have you ever held a grudge against someone and dragged it out all the way to, to court and you refused to settle it? You're the same as that murderer who stabbed somebody to death. But what's the goal of Jesus then in all this? All right, we're wrong. We, we're all there now. We're, we've all broken this commandment. What do we deserve? Well, we deserve death and hell. We've all sinned and come short of the glory of God. So how can we escape when that's the whole point that Jesus is going into in this section? By finding a righteousness that's greater than this external righteousness of the scribes and the Pharisees. By finding a righteousness which is found in the Lord Jesus alone. There. He wants to drive all the people who were listening to that that day there on the, on the mountain. And us today as well. He wants to drive us to our knees at the foot of the cross to accept the imputed righteousness of Jesus. The only righteousness which is able to save us because Jesus lived a thoroughgoing perfection before God. And he died our death. And so though, though every one of us deserved death on the basis of this one commandment alone, yet Jesus offers us life in himself come to him if we come to him for the forgiveness of sins though we deserve to be in Gehenna in the fiery hell we will find life as a free gift given to us shall we pray Lord Jesus <coughs> we admit that we have not kept this, that there's been, been many times we've been angry in our hearts when we've cursed people, we've, we've insulted people, that we all deserve your judgment upon us. But we've also come to see, O oh Lord our God, that where sin abounds, grace does much more abound. And we have come to find our righteousness in Jesus. And we desire, Lord, that, that that righteousness of Jesus that has been given to us will also be worked out progressively in our lives by our sanctification, that we will come more and more, even in our daily actions, to reflect the life of Jesus which is in us. So we say thank you, Lord for not leaving us alone when we well deserved to be left alone and cast out, but for drawing us to yourself and making us your own. In Jesus' name, amen.